Thank you very much, Rosemary. Next, I'd like to introduce John Hoops. Uh, John is a professor at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Kansas and is a former director of the university's Global Indigenous Nations Studies Program. Uh, John specializes in archaeology of Southern Central America and Northern South America. He began conducting archaeological field work in Costa Rica in, uh, since 1978, when as an undergraduate at Yale University, he worked on a project sponsored by the National Museum of Costa Rica in the Linea Vieja region where Minor C. Keith built his famous railroad. His doctoral research at Harvard University was conducted with Professor Payson Sheets at sites, at sites near Lake Arenal. Hoops has since done research at sites uh, near Golfito on the Pacific Coast, and his current research with archaeologists uh, Silvia Salgado and Monica Aguilar at the University of Costa Rica focuses on the ruins of Nuevo Corinto, a pre-Hispanic settlement near Guapiles in the uh, Caribbean lowlands. Hoops is a co-editor of two books, The Emergence of Pottery, Technology and Innovation in Ancient Societies, and Golden Power in Ancient Costa Rica, Panama, and Colombia, and is the author of dozens of articles on the archaeology of Central America. Let's welcome John Hoops to the stage. Thank you very much, Ronald, Ronald, and, and um, for um, the Latino, Smithsonian Latino Center's sponsorship of uh, the exhibition and um, our presence in the National Museum of the American Indian. Uh, my presentation is on interethnic relations and multicultural landscapes, um, and I think it's very important to be cognizant of the fact that we live and take for granted sometimes the multicultural landscape in, in which we exist ourselves. Uh, I want to wish Le Shana Tova to any Jewish attendees and to point out that we are currently in the days of awe um, in the Jewish tradition. And I like to think of the Jews as perhaps the most successful tribal people on the planet in terms of cultural revival, uh, religious and spiritual persistence, the reclamation of traditional territory. And I like to think that the Jewish people are a hope and inspiration for indigenous peoples of all kinds uh, in thinking about what their goals uh, would be. Um, I'd also like to invoke a concept which I think is very Im important and relevant in uh, current issues of civil rights in this country, and that is the notion of allies uh, in struggles for gay and, and lesbian and uh, L LGBT rights. You don't have to be gay or lesbian to be in support of certain civil rights. The good news is you don't have to be indigenous to support indigenous peoples. Um, or to feel that uh, indigenous causes are ones in which you can be very much involved. And I like to think this museum and this exhibit um, is, is very much a, a kind of pilgrimage site to which we can come to remind ourselves uh, of the importance of indigenous identities in this land that we exist, which the indisputable truth is this is Indian land. Regardless of ownership, regardless of legal title, um, I think it's important to be mindful of the fact that the forests and hills and valleys uh, and rivers that we use um, for a variety of different purposes were the land for over on which for more than 10,000 years indigenous peoples lived. Um, I think we need to approach this territory with a, with a, a, a respectful attitude and be mindful of, of that uh, reality. Um, this is a, some graffiti that exists on an uh, Indian reserve in Ontario, Canada, but it actually applies to all of the territory from Alaska down to Tierra del Fuego. We are on Indian land. Um, and there are inspirations to be found in small pockets of this Indian land. In fact, uh, on August 31st, after a 50-year wait, the Liceo Rural uh, Indígena Yimba Kach opened in the community of Rey Cure in southern Costa Rica. Um, and it was uh, an event very well attended and very much anticipated um, in which there are recreations of uh, traditional dances among those, the, uh, the dress of the Diablitos, um, in which a group of men uh, dress up in traditional costumes uh, and essentially are harassed by and harass uh, a bull. Uh, you might be able to guess who that bull stands for uh, after this um, uh, encounter. Things don't typically wind up well for the bull. Um, but um, it's a traditional ceremony that represents this pride in indigenous ancestry. Um, and my colleague Francisco Corrales, 30 years ago, began research in this community which revealed 
that the community sits upon archaeological sites. Um, and that there's pottery there that dates back as early as, uh, as 1500 BC. We're talking about a continuous occupation of a place for 3,500 years. And this is something the community is very mindful of. In spite of whatever rhetoric there may be that indigenous populations are disappearing, they are not. They are still here and they are thriving. And the new high school in Recure has nine new classrooms, one of which is a computer classroom. And I would encourage you to like their Facebook page and to seek to communicate with the high school students of Ray Coure and let them know about this exhibition and this museum and the fact that you value their tradition and will encourage its perpetuation. Uh, and this is something that is happening across the Americas. Well, this use of archaeology for per perpetuating identity is one that um, has been a perpetual uh, uh, fact in the in lives of indigenous people in Central America. Antonio Saldana, the last uh, king of the Bribris uh, in southern Costa Rica um, it can be seen in this portrait made in the early 19th, uh, early 20th century here. But I want you to notice that in addition to his feather headdress, which of course becomes a very important motif up and down the Americas, he's wearing a necklace. And this necklace displays six golden eagles, um, which are representative of his, of his ancestral archaeological past. These are not objects that were made during his time, but rather ones that have been probably recovered from archaeological uh, sites. Uh, but they represent a tradition going back for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, in fact, we find representations of leaders wearing uh, uh, birds, pendants on their, on their necks going back to 1000 AD, 500 AD. In fact, on representations that go back almost uh, 2000 years to the jade, famous jade pendants that are found uh, in the Axe Gods of Costa Rica. Uh, just yesterday, Barbara Arroyo presented um, uh, at the um, uh, Pre-Columbian Society of Washington, D.C. Symposium, uh, archaeological evidence uh, excavated by a colleague of hers of the oldest known uh, royal burial at Abac, uh, at Takalik Abac in Guatemala. And the central object in the necklace of that burial was a bird pendant, probably, I think, from Costa Rica. Um, well, of course, talking about indigenous identity coming up with stories about indigenous identities is something that is very much a part not only of archaeology but also of popular culture. Uh, we all remember the Maya calendar 2012 phenomenon last year which represent, which uh, culminated in uh, celebrations that were happening uh, at Chichen Itza, at Copan, at Palenque and various other places. Along with that we find authentic indigenous voices creating syncretic syncretistic narratives that combine indigenous values with those of new age spirituality. Uh, and I want to say that these are not inauthentic narratives. These are authentic narratives, but represent the wide, a wide variety of different types of narratives uh, that emerge from this. The question becomes, who are the spokesmen? Uh, here we see a dancer at Chichen Itza on the morning of December 21st, speaking to a reporter from the Associated Press. Uh, who then takes that narrative and, uh, and, and spreads it to the world. Uh, whereas, uh, it, for, for me, my favorite face in this photograph is that of the Yucatec uh, Maya who's standing in the background observing this process as it takes place as the narratives are spun, collected, and distributed. And it's important to realize that in addition to a multi-ethnic landscape in which we exist and which existed in the past, it's also a multi-vocal landscape in which it's very difficult to assign authority to any particular voice. All of the voices have a certain authority depending upon uh, what your perspective is, and I think it's very important to honor what those represent uh, and not to take positions of power on a podium in a, in a museum and say, I am giving you the real story. There are many, many real stories, and we need to pay attention to all of those. Um, and the embrace of indigenous culture is something that on December 21st, 2012 was being realized. Places like Palenque, places like Tikal, uh, even in Bogota, Colombia, and as far south as uh, Machu Picchu. Um, in fact, um, celebrations were happening throughout the Americas. Some of them deeply authentic, most of them syncretistic, but nonetheless honoring indigenous identities in a multi-ethnic, multicultural fashion. Uh, dancers at Copan, Honduras represented something that was not an authentic representation of Maya dances. Um, and interesting, the narrative at Copan was one of, this is a Maya ceremony, this is a Maya day. Well, ironically, archaeology suggests that in fact it was the rulers at Copan who were the most Maya of the Copanecos, uh, but in fact there was a multi-ethnic landscape uh, unfolding there. Well, one of my favorite pieces of graffiti from that whole event was this one. Uh, 
No tengo miedo que se acabe el mundo en el 2012. Tengo pánico que siga igual. That is, uh, I'm not afraid that the world will end in 2012. I'm terrified that it's going to continue exactly the same. Uh, and we have opportunities to change those things of the past, including the looting of uh, archaeological heritage um, and the support of archaeology um, uh, that, that reveals what, what was happening. Um, this photograph in the, up, uh, uh, the upper photograph here, um, and here's my pointer, um, is one that represents uh, some of the looting that was taking in pl place in Honduras uh, at the hands of collectors who generated the collections in, in this museum. Uh, this photograph at the bottom was taken in the early 20th century of a scientific archaeological excavation directed by uh, Samuel Lothrop. Um, which was collecting information at Sitio Conte in Panama. What I want you to observe is the uh, further ethnic uh, representation by the workers here. Um, uh, they were uh, black laborers um, who were employed uh, in Honduras and in, in, in Costa Rica. And in addition to the multi-ethnicity of, of uh, Europeans, of indigenous peoples, it's very important to realize the participation of African, uh, people of African descent. Um, in, in the construction of identities in, in, in Latin America. Sadly, looting still continues. These photographs were taken when I was doing archaeological survey in northwestern Costa Rica, uh, and this woman and her son were all too happy to show us their bodega filled with hundreds of pieces of material that had just recently been looted from a cemetery on their finca that was waiting to be picked up that afternoon uh, by someone who was going to take it to market and distribute it. One of the single biggest issues um, in preserving the archaeology today is protecting archaeological sites and preventing the export, further exportation uh, of, of archaeological objects. Well, the study of multi-ethnicity in Central America is one that um, I think is probably fair to say has part of the legacy of cultural imperialism. It was here at the Smithsonian uh, where Will William Henry Holmes, one of the first directors of the Smithsonian Institution, uh, was dividing the world up into culture areas, drawing lines that indicated what the div divisions were between Central America and South America. Uh, Clark Whistler, an archaeologist, uh, further drew ethnic uh, regions that were dividing up territories and separating out the units for our analysis. Um, I don't want to say this was a divide and conquer strategy, but the legacy of how we define the landscape still conditions the way that we think about it uh, and the way that we organize our thoughts, whether we're Mesoamericanists or Andeanists or Antillianists. Um, and in fact, I think it makes sense to sort of shake things up a bit and look at them a little bit differently. And in my own scholarship, among the kinds of things that I've been emphasizing is that an artificial line between Central America and South America is sometimes a bit of a problem. Now, the ex exhibit and the focus of this particular program has been Central America, but I simply want to point out that peoples of Chibchan languages, while heavily distributed in Costa Rica and Panama, also were found in northern Colombia, the area around Bogota, uh, and areas um, near Lake Maracaibo, uh, almost touching on Venezuelan territory. Um, and in fact, uh, I think we need to be thinking across borders and even across continents in terms of our conceptions of the multi-ethnicity that's represented. A term that I've used for characterizing this area is the Chibchan world, which I think tries to get at how these uh, Chibchan language speakers were seeing the area in which they existed. Um, and this is something that echoes the work of Samuel Lothrop, who identified as Chibchan, all of this green area that you see here. Um, but in fact, what we're looking at is a, is a much larger world. It includes the Antilles, perhaps the Bahamas and parts of Florida, Central America as well as North, Northern South America. And one of the models that I've found useful to think about that I'd like to, to propose that, that, that we sort of consider, and this happened while I was playing around with Google Earth one day and decided to just kind of rotate the globe and compare two different basins, uh, is I realized that the Mediterranean, as complex as it is with the cultures of North Africa and of the Levant and Turkey, um, and of course, Greece and Italy and the Adriatic and all of this is more or less the same size as the Caribbean. Uh, and just as uh, scholarship of the Mediterranean has broken up into different uh, areas of concentration, so has that of the, uh, what I like to call the American Mediterranean. And then in perhaps in terms of our conceptions of multi-ethnicity and communication that are happening here, we really need to begin thinking of the Antilles together with areas of Eastern Mesoamerica, Central America, and especially Northern South America, because these people traveled. 
uh, all of the accounts that we have from the Spanish are that they built enormous trading canoes that they used uh, to move back and forth between uh, communities along the coast. And not surprisingly, the most multi-ethnic communities that one finds are the coastal communities, um, where it's very difficult to draw any types of lines around uh, ethnic divisions. Um, and uh, Heather McKillop, in her work in Belize, has demonstrated enormous amounts of um, uh, well-preserved uh, wood artifacts, including things like paddles uh, from these canoes, as well as multi-ethnic contexts and burials that include things such as Ulua polychromes from Honduras uh, and um, uh, um, uh, plum bait wares coming from Pacific uh, Guatemala um, in context uh, together with uh, Yucatec um, or, or Northern Yucatan uh, ceramics. Um, some of these found in the same burial, indicating that individuals were being very eclectic in terms of what they, what they were including and how they were identifying themselves. Well, traces and, and, and hints about contact between Central America and the, and the Antilles are found in this Costa Rican metate that was reported by Joyce, actually 1916 is the, is the correct uh, early date for this publication, but he was finding Costa Rica, a, a Costa Rican metate uh, in Jamaica, of all places. Uh, travel was happening back and forth across the Caribbean. Um, the curved back dujos of the uh, Antilles are very well known as markers of status. They were the seats uh, of power of, of the uh, Taino uh, caciques. Um, and interestingly, these are also found in northern Colombia. Um, in examples that are carved in bone uh, as staff heads, where you can see dujos, where people are sitting on these. Uh, well, Rosemary Joyce mentioned uh, the seats uh, in Costa Rica, which are sometimes identified as metates. Um, and of course, we still um, are, are sort of not completely sure as to how much these may have been used for processing uh, special uh, materials or how much they may have been used as seats. Uh, for me, one of the things that argues for them as seats is the fact that they are decorated with those very animals, such as jaguars and loquacious parrots um, and other creatures that speak to, well, that represent speaking. Leadership was a part of speaking and having the seat may very have much, much have been like having the floor, being able to be up at a podium and speak the podium is my metate. It's what gives me the ability to speak to the people who uh, are listening to what it is that I have to say. Um, and it's, it, it goes along with leadership. Well, other hints of contacts between the Caribbean uh, and, and the Antilles and Costa Rica include objects that are made out of uh, uh, fine-grained stone, such as this from the site of La Hueca on the far western, I'm, I'm sorry, far eastern, a small island on the far eastern side of Puerto Rico, um, very similar to those found uh, in the Caribbean watershed in Costa Rica, carved in jade that itself had been imported from southern Guatemala. So we find um, a, a mixture of materials and a mixture of motifs uh, representing communication over a large area. Um, on these uh, very spectacular flying panel matates from Costa Rica, here's that motif again of the bird pecking on a severed head here. Uh, this is the one that's being represented in both the Antilles and, and Costa Rica. And these are things that would have been recognized across uh, probably a fairly large area. Well, I'm not gonna saw, say a lot about uh, these similarities in settlement patterns, simply, except to say the circular house uh, 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 platforms um, uh, that can, can, are configured to the natural landscape, not oriented um, uh, to the cardinal directions, are ones that are found in Costa Rica, they're found in northern Colombia, and a lot of very uh, significant similarities across uh, large uh, geographic regions in terms of the layouts of communities, the structure of communities, and probably the social uh, 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 structure that was underlying these. Um, here you see a Bribri house, a uh, historic Bribri house from southern Costa Rica, and a temple of the Cogi in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, uh, and the similarities in architecture uh, and how that architecture represents the house and community should be very well evident. Well, needless to say, the cultural landscape of Central America is extraordinarily complex. Uh, people always ask me, well, who were they? Were they, were they the Mayas? Were they the, were they the Aztecs? Uh, well, it gets very, very complicated. Uh, this is Doris Stone's map of, of languages across Central America at the time of the Spanish conquest. Uh, and needless to say, it's very highly problematic. She was basing this on ethnohistoric sources, most of which were incomplete. Uh, Terence Kaufman has attempted to uh, also put together a map of Mesoamerican languages at the time of the conquest, and he extends down into Central America with territories of the Chorotega and the Nicaragua farther south. Uh, but again, these are problematic. Uh, groups migrated. We have groups such as the Chorotega and the Nicarao who come down from areas of southern Mexico uh, and possibly from central Mexico uh, into areas of uh, Nicaragua and, and, and northwestern Costa Rica. There are also groups that migrate up 
from the uh, coast of, uh, of Colombia and also from areas in, near the Rio Atrato, uh, which is where the uh, Cuna of the San Blas Islands originate. Um, so there are people moving into the area, uh, making for a very, mul uh, very complex and multicultural uh, landscape. Uh, well, one of the most useful um, tools in looking at this landscape is a map that was put together by geographer Mac Chapin uh, in association with the National Geographic Society. It was published in their February 2003 issue and is still in print. And I would strongly encourage you uh, to look out to look for this map because I think that you'd find it to be uh, e extraordinarily helpful in terms of understanding the complexity of ethnic identity in, in Central America. Uh, among the kinds of things that we find in maps are discrepancies between the way uh, territories were represented. Uh, this is Johnson's 1948 map of, um, it's a little bit difficult to see, uh, this is the Gulf of Fonseca, here we see uh, um, uh, El Salvador, and here Honduras, and he's showing Linca territory extending far uh, to, the, to the west here, whereas Doris Stone in her later map uh, drew Linca territory like this, putting it along the border between uh, Honduras and Nicaragua. Well, uh, where is Linca territory? It's a very difficult thing to say, and who were the Linca? Well, this becomes of an important part of dispute over sites uh, such as uh, claiming heritage in the, in the Maya site of Copan, where we find Chorti Maya who live in the area today, uh, sometimes in conflict with Lincas who want to identify the site as their own. Um, I think it's best if archaeologists stay out of those conflicts. In fact, the name Linca is a very difficult one to peg to any archaeological cultures, particularly because this area is one of the least known of Honduras in terms of its archaeology. More archaeology is needed in order to be able to establish the relationships uh, between these historic groups um, and, uh, and living groups. Well, another extraordinarily complex area of multi-ethnic uh, presence is that of eastern Honduras. The area of Mosquitia, which itself has complexity because of movement along the Caribbean coast, but also uh, the Rio uh, Platano and the Patuca, uh, going up into Biosphere Reserves, where we find groups like the Pech, a Chibchan-speaking group, the Tawaka, a Misumalpan-speaking group, uh, as well as the Mesquito along the coast, uh, and the Sumu a little bit farther in. Uh, it's very difficult to draw lines around ethnic territories, especially when people are moving up and down the rivers and establishing uh, relationships with each other. Uh, and I, needless to say, humans do not stick to ethnicity always or usually when it comes to pairing and having families and multi-ethnic families with, uh, with, with um, a combination of, uh, of Pech and Tawaka parents are really not unusual at all. And we find bilingual communities where people are speaking multiple languages. In fact, the assumption of monolingualism, uh, which is something that tends to be an American tendency, I think is, is, is a mistake in most cases. These people were probably speaking multiple languages, including linguas francas, that allowed them to, uh, to, to engage in trade and travel over large areas. Uh, among the things that make things even more complicated is when archaeologists step in uh, and identify and actually map sites um, that look a little bit Mesoamerican in terms of their layout. And Chris Begley, who's done the, prin the principal archaeological work in this area, has identified things like ball courts, which are uh, very uh, recognizable Mesoamerican traits uh, in this area of eastern Honduras, although Chris points out that he does not think this represents a Mesoamerican migration, but rather the use by the elites, the adoption of this practice that they had learned about and were familiar with, but that modified themselves and were doing in different ways, even though the architecture itself is quite similar. Well, this is an area where some very interesting uh, new work is coming out from. In fact, some of you may have read about the use of LIDAR for the exploration of, of archaeological sites in eastern Honduras. I expect we'll be learning even more complex things coming out of there again. Well, the hunt for ethnicity um, is one that is extremely challenging. Uh, and my colleague Jeff McCafferty at the University of Calgary has actually for the past 10 years, uh, worked in areas of southwestern Nicaragua specifically for the purpose of identifying Chortega, Chorotega, and Nicarao groups um, that, uh, according to tradition, migrated from Mesoamerica down into this area, um, possibly around 800 AD or so. Uh, and among the kind of, kinds of things that uh, Jeff has been enormously frustrated by is that he finds traces of very important connections with Mesoamerica in terms of pottery designs. But so many other things that are Mesoamerican are missing that he's very reluctant to identify uh, Santa Isabel, uh, the community that we, he originally thought may have been the Nicaragua capital, as having even a, a, a predominantly Mesoamerican character because it's missing ball courts, it's missing incensarios, it's missing comales, um, it's missing a number of Mesoamerican traits that suggest a persistence perhaps of Chibchan identity with the elites adopting elements of artwork 
uh, that supported their power uh, and represented uh, a connection with the, with the exotic. Uh, it was a way of using the uh, alterity of Mesoamerica to represent one's authority in local situations, although undoubtedly there were some people who had migrated down and who had brought uh, connections with, uh, with central Honduras and, and with El, El Salvador. Uh, but it's very, very complicated. And even detailed archaeological studies with enormous preservation uh, or very good preservation of macrobotanical remains have left more questions than answers. In fact, one of the quintessential characteristics of Mesoamerican populations is the consumption of maize. In spite of the fact that they've had very good macrobotanical preservation, maize doesn't even seem to be present in significant quantities at Santa Isabel. What's going on there? A multi-ethnic landscape of older uh, and more recent populations. Well, it becomes very difficult to trace what was happening with Nahuatl speakers. Uh, uh, Samuel Lothrop identified communities near the mouth of the Rio San Juan and also uh, near the, uh, um, um, the, the uh, Rio uh, Sisaola in, in southern Costa Rica. But were these Aztec colonies? I'm very skeptical of that. In fact, um, among the kinds of things that we find in the Spanish records is uh, the Spanish explorers would come and, and, and use guides that they picked up along the western side of Lake Nicaragua who would then take them up along the coast here. Or they would take them down to uh, uh, the, the coast of Panama. Uh, and in fact, rather than being Aztec Pochteca coming from way up in the north, um, I think that there's a possibility that these small enclaves were actually trading communities of Nicarao uh, or other Nahuatl speakers from western Nicaragua um, who established themselves in locations possibly for the procurement of gold that was traded north or for the procurement uh, perhaps of the legacy of a much more ancient uh, trade route that went up to the sources of, of jade that are found in, in southern Guatemala. Um, complex landscapes are also found uh, along uh, the coast of, um, uh, of, uh, of Nicaragua. Um, and in fact, as I mentioned, some of the most complex multi-ethnic landscapes are those that are found along the Caribbean coast. Um, my colleague uh, Norberto Baldi has recently completed a doctoral dissertation at, uh, at the University of Kansas uh, focusing on the Rama populations, and he's actually been successful in using genetics to be able to identify some markers that indicate the Rama um, as a Chibchan population that actually has some ancient, ancient connections with populations of northern um, uh, uh, Colombia. But he's also been able to reveal a great deal of admixture, especially when looking at Y chromosomes. And in fact, among the kinds of interesting patterns that come out of the genetic work is it seems to be mostly the women who were the curators of the mitochondrial DNA and those lineages who tended to be more uh, uh, geographically stable, where it was the men who were moving and bringing uh, a lot of variation in Y chromosome DNA uh, from other communities up and down the coast. Well, one of the most uh, important areas where I've been doing uh, uh, research is in this area of eastern Costa Rica. And I wanted to point out that one of the characteristics um, of Central American archaeology that's kind of unfortunate is that those areas in which we have the, the most interesting archaeological phenomenon taking place is taking place are in areas that we are where we find unclassified tribes, where we can say practically nothing about what the identity, uh, specific identities were at the time of the Spanish conquest, archaeology becomes the only way that we can constitute uh, some, of these, uh, some of these ancient identities. Um, and in fact, it's in this area known as the Linea Vieja region, where Silvia Salgado of the University of Costa Rica, Monica Aguilar, and Patricia Fernandez and I have been working um, to map uh, the site of uh, Nuevo Corinto, which, like Rey Cure, actually has an occupation that goes all the way back to 1500 BC with some uh, continuous evidence of continuous occupation um, from the early formative all the way up until um, the, the late period, roughly around 1500 uh, AD. But among the kinds of things that we find uh, is that he, uh, the, the, the architectural core was built between about 700 and 1100 AD, uh, a period during which there was a reification of status and authority uh, within this place uh, that resulted in the construction of large circular house mounds, plazas that some of which may actually be water features, um, and uh, calzadas and roadways that lead between uh, different portions of the site. Uh, here you see some of the large uh, house uh, mounds uh, that were constructed uh, for the homes and residences of the elite. Uh, we also get rectangular plazas that may have been roofed uh, workshop uh, areas. And among the kinds of things that we find in terms of uh, uh, construction include uh, the use of, uh, of river cobbles that were brought from the nearby high velocity rivers and streams uh, in order to create uh, houses um, and causeways uh, and walled uh, plazas. Well, in Panama, interestingly, it's precisely the area where Richard Cook uh, 
and his associates have done some of the most interesting archaeology around uh, Parita Bay uh, and the Esuero Peninsula, which, if you look at the uh, ethnic maps, are the ones in which we have um, uh, the, the least in, in terms of people who are identifying um, a, a, a present uh, indigenous ethnic identity. Um, and interestingly, Panama is one of those areas where it's actually the areas where we have the largest indigenous communities where we have the least archaeology. Uh, and the areas where we have the, lar the greatest amount of archaeology where we actually have the most difficulty in linking them to specific ethnic, ethnic populations. Archaeology can play a very important role uh, in identifying these, uh, these ancient identities. Um, I wanted to mention Julia Mayo's work at, um, uh, at, at El Cano, uh, which is revealing new information uh, uh, on uh, an area in which uh, Lothrop and Mason had, had, had earlier excavated some of the most spectacular uh, gold-bearing uh, cemeteries uh, ever found in, in, in the Americas. Um, and among the kinds of things that she's revealing is much greater detail of information about possible contacts between Colombia uh, and central Panama, as well as between central Panama and areas of, of Costa Rica and, and, and up to the north, as well as revealing some interesting statuary um, that um, uh, is, is clearly being associated with, with these uh, burial grounds, which may actually represent a high status uh, necropoli to which people were bringing um, people from uh, uh, high status individuals to bury from all over. Another area uh, in which we have relatively little information about uh, the current ethnicity, although it's almost certainly primarily indigenous, uh, is central Nicaragua, uh, where my colleague uh, Alex Gerds from the University of Leiden uh, is, is undertaking a project where he's actually found the largest and most extensive settlements that have been documented anywhere in Central America. Uh, Rosemary Joyce mentioned these with over 500 mounds. Uh, we still can't relate those to a specific ethnic group. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, it's going to be very interesting to, to, I, I, to determine um, what it is that these contribute to our understanding of the multi-ethnic relationships going on between Nicaragua uh, and Costa Rica. Well, getting into archaeology of uh, areas of Costa Rica, among the kinds of things that are found are relationships, in fact, long distance relationships between, for example, northwestern Costa Rica and um, uh, areas of El Salvador. In particular, uh, the, my colleague uh, uh, Michael Snarskis, the late Michael Snarskis, who passed away a couple of years ago, was one of the giants in Costa Rican archaeology. And one of his last projects was at a site called Lomas Corral, uh, where among the kinds of objects that he excavated included objects that are very clearly classic uh, 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 bridge and spout vessels of, of uh, Usulatan style from, uh, from El Salvador in association with direct association with jade pendants. Um, so we know we can, we can kind of get a picture of how pottery was traveling long distances and how jade was being used. Well, jade pendants and jade uh, objects and materials very similar to them were ones that were traded all over uh, Central America. Uh, in fact, we find uh, very similar kind of prototypes to them in late preclassic contexts at places like uh, Playa de los Muertos. Um, they've also been found in the northern Yucatan and the Chaxintin uh, cache, which is probably mostly objects of late preclassic origin, although they appear to have been redeposited uh, in late classic times. Uh, we also find uh, Maya objects, very well known in areas of northwestern Costa Rica, most of which have been cut in half. Or, uh, uh, or otherwise altered uh, and, 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 um, and, and drilled in different ways for their use in Costa Rica, probably because the people who were using them could not read the glyphs that were located on them, but the Mayas were taking advantage of this um, multi-ethnicity in order to discard hazardous objects to them that contain historical records that they did not want to have preserved or known. So they would divide these objects up and, and probably trade them to the south. Interestingly, in eastern Costa Rica, we get objects that are coming probably as, as far away as Teotihuacan. Carl Taub has identified this uh, shade, this uh, shell uh, mirror back <clears throat> as actually being a representation of spondylus divers in Teotihuacan style who are visiting spondylus beds where they're recovering shell um, that was then uh, carved into um, uh, valuable objects that were used at, at Teotihuacan, which uh, came from uh, great distances away. Um, at places like Altun Ha, we find caches, in this case a stone vessel, which contained a tumbaga uh, or a gold alloy uh, a jaguar claw, as well as a shell and a jade pendant, which were cut with very, uh, very uh, a distinctive string sawing, which is a process of drilling holes and then using an abrasive string to carve between those holes uh, in a working very typical of uh, Costa Rican uh, jade work, uh, which is found um, and, and associated with them were also found some of these small uh, pendants. Well, interestingly, the Mayas are using um, uh, 
Costa Rican uh, jade objects. But interestingly, they're, they're not seizing upon them or not using them for their iconographic imagery or power. In fact, uh, in one of the necklaces uh, found in a, of a royal king at Copan, uh, you can see these beautifully carved uh, Maya um, objects that are flanked by a small and relatively crudely made uh, axe god from Costa Rica, which is the central pendant in his necklace. Um, clearly, uh, the Mayas are assigning tremendous importance to objects that they're obtaining from the distant Costa Ricans. It's not just stuff going to Costa Rica, but things coming the, in the other direction. And there may be a, some magic associated with this, in particular, uh, these jade tubes made uh, with um, uh, 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 Guatemalan jade from, uh, from Costa Rica, uh, I'm sorry, made with jade from Guatemalan sources, are being used and worked in Costa Rica and seem to be associated with uh, issues of, of, of transformation. In fact, these objects are found almost exclusively on individuals who are shown either wearing masks or who are transforming into, into animals. And so these objects uh, clearly become objects of, of magic and power uh, that are associated with this uh, type of transformation. Well, among the most important transformations were those of, uh, that, that invoked the crocodile. Uh, representations of the crocodile are ones that appear uh, in pottery in Costa Rica around AD 500 or so, in some cases in very stylized forms, but it was this crocodile identity that may help us recognize the most important individuals uh, in, in Costa Rican society. In fact, the ability to take on the qualities of a crocodile becomes an important uh, aspect that communicated within iconography. Uh, this famous piece from Bagasis in Costa Rica is an individual who's wearing gold discs, he's wearing uh, representations of, uh, of, of double-headed crocodiles, crocodiles uh, here, and he's also decorated with crocodile scoots. In fact, the decoration on the back of him, uh, rarely seen, but uh, thanks to a, a photograph provided by the National Museum of Costa Rica, we can see a small seated crocodile on the back of his head, um, which is very similar to crocodiles that are uh, appear in pottery from Panama. In fact, uh, one of the interesting things about uh, the crocodile imagery is that it suggests that, in fact, although we may have we thought for some time that uh, much of this iconography was coming south from Mesoamerica, that in fact it's much more closely related to what's happening in central Panama, where crocodiles are especially prominent in the iconography of the Conte style of Cocle pottery in, in central Panama, where we find representations of crocodile, uh, uh, of, of anthropomorphic crocodiles, uh, probably uh, in the roles of uh, important uh, magical uh, performers um, and, and ritual uh, leaders. Uh, I wanted to point out that the Mayas also, of course, found crocodiles very important. Um, and that uh, Copan Burial Tin contains a headless crocodile. The head of a crocodile is part of the name glyph of the individual uh, place within this burial. And uh, lest you think the transformation into animals uh, and the taking of decapitated heads is something that indicates the savagery of these Chibchan groups to the south, let me simply point out that the Mayas were doing exactly the same thing. They were representing themselves as animals with animal masks um, and perhaps even representations of crocodiles. And of course, they were displaying the, the, the uh, trophy heads of their, um, of, 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 of their enemies. Um, Crocodile transformation is something interesting that's found in statuary from eastern Costa Rica. Uh, this example, which is uh, on loan to the uh, National Museum of the American Indian from the Brooklyn Museum, uh, thanks very much to the generosity and collaboration of uh, curator Nancy Rossoff, um, is one of the central objects within the, um, the uh, exhibition uh, upstairs. Um, and I would like to submit that it, the representation here is one that is inspired perhaps by imagery of this crocodile individual uh, found in, in, in uh, central Panama. Representations um, of uh, beings, uh, such as those found on um, ceramics from uh, eastern Costa Rica, may be inspired by, uh, by, by uh, cochle pieces from central Panama. And in fact, this emphasizes that we need to look south and not just north for the sources of uh, style and, um, and, and inspiration in uh, central, uh, central Costa Rican uh, ceramics. Uh, in fact, here you can see some examples of uh, what would be identified as Mora Chicot type from Greater Nicoya, um, but I submit that these are um, copies in Costa Rica of the uh, Cochle style that's being generated in central Panama. Um, themes that are found on um, Costa Rican uh, pots include ones that are also found in uh, central uh, Panamanian uh, ceramics. Um, and here you see some examples, other examples that come from Las Mercedes um, with this uh, uh, Macaracas uh, polychrome. Of course, something that we can recognize from the famous gold pectorals at places like Sitio Conte and are also part of the iconographic theme uh, in these flying panel matates.
Um, well, needless to say, there's a great deal of, uh, of, of, of iconographic evidence that suggests that crocodile personas were an important across the board, uh, from Panama to Costa Rica, um, and uh, extending all the way up into areas of, uh, of southern Mes Mesoamerica, and emphasize the need to look across this entire region, both Panama and Costa Rica, for the types of connections that were taking place, which, of course, uh, uh, crossed through this very important area of the Sonosur uh, in Costa Rica. I'm just going to end. I'm re running out of time a little bit, so I'm going to compress a few things I wanted to mention at the end. Uh, but there are some intriguing uh, motifs, including the famous uh, Khan Cross, a representation of the Quincunx, found in Costa Rican pottery, uh, which is also found in uh, Ulua pottery uh, from central Honduras. Again, emphasizing the role of of communication between these areas. Um, the very important work by Ron Bishop of the Smithsonian Institution and Fred Lang in sourcing ceramics has helped us to understand better the multi-ethnic nature uh, or the, the, the multi-community nature of the production of polychrome pottery in, um, in, in Greater Nicoya. With, um, this would be a cluster uh, based on compositional analysis associated with Maya, uh, Mora polychrome, and this would be a cluster here associated with Papagayo polychrome. In fact, among the things that they suggest were taking place in Greater Nicoya was the existence of ceramic schools up and down the area of, of Greater Nicoya, each of which was training and producing people in specific in production of specific ceramic styles. Uh, and then it was across this multi-ethnic landscape that these styles were uh, were shared and, and, and traded in order to uh, produce um, the assemblages that, that archaeologists encounter. It also created situations in which some styles were being copied, uh, imported styles copied in local imitations. Um, I'm going to finish with la one last example. Rosemary Joyce talked about uh, um, long-distance communications and ended with a, uh, a very nice image of boats approaching Chichen Itza. And I just wanted to mention that Chichen Itza and the sacred cenote at Chichen Itza is one that is revealing enormous amounts of information about long distance trade uh, and inter-ethnic contact. In fact, objects from central Honduras, objects from Costa Rica, objects from Panama are all being found within the sacred cenote, uh, which itself may be a repository for a lot of the trade that was taking place back and forth. Well, the gold disks of of the sacred cenote are ones that came from Costa Rica and Panama. They were redecorated with designs uh, by the Mayas uh, at Chichen Itza, and interestingly, they seem to depict interethnic conflict itself or interethnic inter contact itself uh, taking place uh, on on the um, on the discs themselves. In particular, I just wanted to point out uh, that on on this particular disc, actually the main figure is that of a large canoe um, with people in Maya dress. Um, obviously uh, 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 in control and, and sort of attacking groups that are in distress and seem to be fleeing. Uh, but the second group is one that's represented by very different types of headdresses. And instead of traveling in canoes, they're actually on balsas or rafts uh, that were uh, possibly made of planks on top of uh, of, of, of floating balsa logs. Uh, this may itself represent one of these inter-ethnic uh, associations and among the kinds of things we need to consider uh, when we look at the, inter, uh, the, the international or, or the, um, the, the, the long distance objects deposited within the sacred cenote, that they may not have been thrown in as objects themselves, but may have been being worn by individuals from different ethnicities who had been captured or come in contact with the Mayas and who were being put into the cenote themselves. Um, I'm going to finish with one last illusion um, that is something intriguing to me in terms of uh, other contacts that merit much more uh, careful uh, in, in, in investigation, and that is Maria Masucci, who's been working with polychromes of coastal Ecuador, um, ha and I have been uh, sort of exchanging notes on the Guangala polychrome style of Western um, of, of the coast of Ecuador, which has some intriguing similarities to this Mora polychrome uh, ceramic of Costa Rica, which has always been assumed to have had uh, northern or Mesoamerican inspiration. Uh, well, in fact, uh, the ceramics of coastal Ecuador include polychromes that look surprisingly similar to some of those types of vessels that we're seeing in Central America, um, and a, uh, a new frontier, uh, as it were, in terms of investigation is looking to see whether these uh, coastal uh, relationships extended not only from the Gulf of Fonseca down to the Gulf of Nicoya, and from the Gulf of Nicoya uh, down into central Panama, but possibly from, uh, from northwestern Costa Rica as far south uh, as coastal Ecuador. Uh, and it really is thinking outside of these culture areas, thinking out of these boundaries that we've drawn that will allow us to perceive these types of things. Well, these are stories that need to be told to the children. These are stories that need to be given to the new generation. And the kids who are at the uh, Liceo Yimba Kach uh, 
in uh, Ray Coure need to understand that these are things that we value and that we cherish um, and that they become a part of the new generation's integration into a multi-ethnic landscape itself, which allows them to honor their indigenous past uh, and, and celebrate it, while at the same time uh, valuing their participation within the national programs of the countries to which they belong. But I'll finish with that, and thank you very much. Okay, so before we break for lunch, we've got time for a few questions, if anybody has them. And this time I'll be happy to walk the mic to you. I'll just ask that you keep your questions uh, brief. Very brief, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk, John. I, I wonder if you cared to speculate any more about the negative associations between um, strong ethnic presences and lack of archaeology. The, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, between strong ethnic presences and the lack of ideology? Of archaeology. Lack of archaeology. Ah, yes, of course. Well, I think it's, 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 it's a very important to be mindful of the fact that archaeology has time and time again uh, been used in the support of ethnicity and ideology. And we only need to look at the very tragic case of what was happening in, in, uh, in Europe in the 1930s, uh, in which under, under the, the, the Nazi regime, archeological sites in Poland were utterly destroyed because it made it look like the Poles were more advanced than the Germans at a particular time in Iron Age history. At the same time, the Nazis contributed to the construction and honoring of actually fake archeological sites. In, in fact, they created shrines that they claimed went way back into the past, when in fact there was no archeological support uh, to, to, to in, in, in favor of that. Um, I think we need to be extremely cautious about the power of ethnicity and the, 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 the well, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, and I think the 2012 phenomenon serves as a bit of a parable um, in that the speculative statements made by archaeologists can have absolutely unexpected and unintended consequences uh, when they're taken into a popular vein and reinterpreted. Uh, archaeologists need to be very circumspect about the statements that they make about ethnicity or ethnic identity. Um, these can be very powerful statements when they're seized upon and used in the context of, of, of ideologies. I prefer to stress the multi-ethnic nature of these uh, communities rather than identifying a particular community as having a strong ethnic identity to search for those ways in, in which there are exceptions to that rule and exceptions to those identities. I think among those uh, multiple identities uh, that we want to look for are ones that include an honoring and a respect of uh, female identity and female roles. Too often, it's the males and the leaders who are asserting this is what our identity is, when in fact the women know that there are different identities that are, that are happening at, at, at work there, um, especially in a fluid landscape. And I may be getting into dangerous territory, especially one in which the women own the houses and often uh, own the territory and are at home uh, and are entertaining multiple male visitors who may come from a variety of different places. Uh, the women understand the multi-ethnicity of their families. The men may create fictions uh, that in fact they're far more uniform than in fact they actually are. Um, but, but we know that these kinds of fluid relationships take place all the time. Um, an interesting uh, characteristic of matrilocal societies is that women will own the houses and will own the territory. And in fact, it may have been advantageous for them to have relationships um, with males who had relationships with a variety of different ethnic, uh, a variety of different ecological, ec ecological zones. Uh, the complexity of kinship relationships is one that we are just beginning to appreciate within our own society. And I would simply like to volunteer that, uh, or suggest that our own constrictions in terms of thinking about what a family is and what a family represents um, have placed some blinders with regard to considering multiple possibilities that probably existed in the indigenous past of Central America. And these kinds of things make ethnicity uh, and identity extraordinarily complex. Um, and uh, in fact, I think it's probably fair to say that everywhere, everywhere that archaeologists have thought, sought to identify a clear identity, they have been frustrated and in fact have discovered that things are mar far more complicated 
um, than, than they seem at first. And I would simply advise each of you to explore your own identity, and I think you'll find it's far more complex than, than the simple story that you may begin with. Two more questions? One yes. Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, I come from the eastern part of El Salvador, where the Lenca are still living, and also there is another population called the Cacahuira, which you know, we has a, a big presence. Uh, one question that I have is that I have noticed that when you know there are cultural events that they celebrate, it's more focused on the religious aspect. And I was wondering if, if maybe not now, but at some point, if you can point what other uh, cultural aspects identify the, you know, the original people. I don't know if you have studied them or if you can point me to a book that, where I can read a little bit more. Uh, well, we could speak afterwards about, uh, about specific sources. Uh, one of the things that I, I want to mention, though, is that eastern El Salvador is one of those areas about which we really would like to know much more archaeologically. The documentation of archaeological sites, and this is something that indigenous communities can participate in themselves in terms of creating maps of their, their own landscapes. Um, but um, it, 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 it's, it's one that we, we really would like to know more about. With regard to celebration of ethnic identity, um, religion tends to be a contentious issue. In fact, I think it's probably fair to say that the history of the Americas has been one of the replacement of many religious traditions by, by, by others. Um, I have a suggestion for, for, for actually the, the best way to express ethnicity. Uh, I'm kind of partial to food um, and drink. And festivals that surround food uh, and traditional production of food and traditional consumption of food, as well as the ability to recognize and appreciate different ethnic foods and beverages uh, becomes a very important part of that. That's one of the most brilliant things about this museum. Uh, go to the cafeteria and you will see how food is used to reinforce uh, ethnic identity. Uh, as I mentioned, archaeologically, that's one of the things that uh, Professor Joyce mentioned and that I, I uh, emphasized as well, looking for food ways, understanding, did they use comales or didn't they? Did they consume maize or were they consuming uh, other, other things, manioc? Were they hunting? Were they fishing? Focusing on food, I think, is one of the, one of the ways that we can begin to get at that, uh, that varied multicultural landscape um, while not necessarily delving into those areas of, of religion and, and ideology, which can be problematic, um, especially because ideology is often articulated by a minority seeking power rather than by uh, the larger uh, population, which will buy into it or not, depending on how much they want to participate in that, in that power. Uh, but the discourse of ideology is always a discourse about power, and discourse about power is always about uh, a minority um, uh, minorities' interests uh, versus those of, of, of the larger group, just in, in a generalization. I'm sorry? I, I, I would love to come, and I will come hungry. Um, I just wanted to actually go back to Joan Jarrow's uh, question, because I think there's another way of addressing it. I think you were commenting on the maps of and I have to stress that those are maps of late 20th century distributions of populations speaking indigenous languages. Um, and I stress this because where I work in Honduras near San Pedro Sula, there are no, that map is blank as well. Um, that doesn't mean that the people there do not have deep indigenous roots. My husband's um, doctoral dissertation, using colonial documents, we can trace the town uh, from the archaeological site inhabited in the 16th century all the way through the 19th century. And what disrupts the continuity then is the wars of Central America between the Central American Republic and people have to relocate because the army is coming through. Um, in terms of why there's more archaeology where indigene indigenous populations didn't hold their territory as much, it's not so much in Central America because people went to indigenous territories and were, were forced out or were not welcome. They didn't even bother going there. Archaeology in Central America, this is the deep secret we all know, was done where it was convenient. And it was convenient to do near the Spanish cities and where the banana railroads in particular allowed you to go. So if you look at the map of the known archaeological sites at Linea Vieja, 
in, El Salvador, in, in Costa Rica is named after the old railroad line. In Honduras, if you look at the banana plantations, that's where the sites were known. So the, um, the, the convenience factor, which was the deeply colonized lawn um, administered, but even in those areas, and this is critical to, to emphasize, indigenous people were there, and in fact, they were, they were conducting their traditional religious ceremonies. Um, the people in the Alua Valley in the 1700s were still cultivating cacao, and they, tell, they told the Spanish when they needed help to hold on to their territory that that cacao was important for the land, for the earth. And we know that the Lenca people in Honduras um, practice compostura, uh, ceremonies for the earth that use cacao. And even though the people in, in Tikamaya and in Mosca, the towns that we study, spoke Spanish, dressed in Spanish-style clothing, had by the 18th century adopted Spanish foodways, and so would be invisible in all those ways, religion actually was a strong and powerful domestic current of continued identity. So I think, I think you have to actually acknowledge that. But that's, I wanted to speak to Joan's original question. Um, if we have just a brief time for a question that I have for, for Professor Joyce, um, something that I've, I've pondered and I have my own ideas about, but that I think is, is something that, that, that merits some discussion, is whether archaeology has an appropriate role in helping indigenous communities um, to assert territorial claims. Um, this is, my presentation deliberately talked about towns as the locus of identity. Your presentation uses what in fact is a European logic in which, and we've talked about this so you know this as well as I do, in which language groups equal ethnicities, and that's a product of 19th century nation building in Europe, where drawing the lines around France meant saying people are French if they speak this language, and also erasing the differences in languages within France. So if you go to southern France, people in southern France actually talk a different kind of French. If you go to the, the Breton coast, people actually speak a Celtic language. But they're all French by definition. So from my perspective, the entities that, that have integrity historically are the town. And towns do need our help establishing that they've been there for a very long time. When governments come in and say, you shouldn't have a right, uh, a voice in whether we put a hydroelectric dam here. Um, but that's not territoriality in the European nation building sense. That's autonomy and self-determination. Well, and my, <clears throat> my example of Rey Cure in Southern Costa Rica is, is an example of, of a community that has been successful in doing that. And, and where archaeology, I think, has spoken to that. Thanks, thanks for the work of Francisco Corrales, who will be speaking this afternoon. Thank you very much.